Welcome to Eye on America. I'm Michelle Miller. Today, we bring you rare inside access to the team, solutions, and strategies keeping Americans safer. In New York, we sit down for an exclusive interview with the new YouTube CEO to discuss difficult decisions he makes about online safety and misinformation. And in Maryland, we get a never before seen look at how the Secret Service trains their elite task force. But we begin with one of the most devastating public health issues of our time, the opioid crisis. In California, officials are cracking down on fentanyl being smuggled across its borders. Nicole Skanga reports from a secret location where the state is employing the latest tactics against the war on drugs. In an unmarked building, hidden inside a vault, and locked behind security gates. The spoils of the war against drugs. The drugs are right here with the fentanyl. Chief among the stacks, fentanyl and its so-called precursors, the chemicals used to make the deadly drug. We're at a secret location inside a U.S. government bunker. All we can tell you is that we're in California. Beside me, nearly 8,500 pounds of fentanyl and its chemical precursors soon to be destroyed. But before the fentanyl is destroyed, officers have to find it, scouring shipments taken off cargo flights at Los Angeles International Airport. Many packages originating from China. This literally is ground zero for our fight against fentanyl precursors. CBP Acting Commissioner Troy Miller oversees Operation Artemis, the U.S. counter-narcotics mission that intercepted more than 8,000 pounds of chemical precursors in the last three months. This is an emergency. It's an opioid epidemic where we need to go after the transnational criminal organizations. Synthetic opioids like fentanyl kill more than 70,000 people in the U.S. annually. She was a bright little girl like 15-year-old Melanie Ramos found lifeless in her L.A. high school bathroom last year. Her aunt calls fentanyl the devil's pill. It's, it's poisonous. It's poison. It's playing roulette with your life. Another troubling trend, U.S. officials have seized hundreds of pill presses, a sign that drug gangs are making pills on U.S. soil. You can literally press pills in an apartment complex and you can press thousands of pills. And we're seeing that in the U.S. now. We're seeing it in the U.S. U.S. intelligence warns much of those chemical precursors are disguised in air cargo, deliberately mislabeled as children's toys, clothing, even workout equipment before being seized right here at LAX. We continue now with a new approach to helping veterans of the war on terror. The Operator Relief Fund helps connect veterans with services that address challenges, including stress disorders and substance abuse. Catherine Herridge speaks with a former special operations soldier about turning his life around after he says a traumatic brain injury nearly robbed him of everything. Where we come from, you pull the trigger if it solves a problem. I was a problem that had to be solved. A retired Delta operator, Derek Natalini, told CBS News he wouldn't trade his 20 years of service for anything, but it came with a price. I felt like I was hiding who I was from everybody. I didn't understand why I couldn't think. I didn't understand why I couldn't feel responsibly. I didn't understand why I hurt so much. I can hear you. The rest of the world hears you. President Bush was at New York City's Ground Zero. His words galvanized the nation. And the people who knocked these buildings down will hear all of us soon. And within days, elite military and intelligence operatives known as shadow warriors became the tip of the spear. There's a calling. It's got to start there. Your heart's on fire for something. Natalini completed more than two dozen deployments, including Afghanistan and Iraq, where he says door breaches and improvised explosive devices caused a traumatic brain injury or TBI. After he left the Army in 2017, Natalini says he felt lost and landed in a very dark place. You had a gun in your hand and you were seconds away from ending your life. I had it pressed to the side of my head, yeah. And you were able to pull back. Yeah. Are there other shadow warriors out there who are also struggling? 
Well, it's emphatically yes. Emphatically yes. According to recent VA data, the suicide rate for veterans was 57 percent greater than non-veterans. The rate of suicide amongst all veterans, but shadow warriors in particular, is, is, is obscenely high. For more than a decade, Pac Fancher has raised money for educational scholarships benefiting the children of fallen intelligence and military operatives. <laughs> Through discreet concert events so secret, the name and location are on a need-to-know basis. You've brought in some big names over the years. ZZ Top, Peter Frampton, Steve Miller Band, Lenny Kravitz, Sammy Billy Hager, Idol. Billy Idol. We had Brad Paisley. Fancher is now working with Natalini to launch the Operator Relief Fund, a clearinghouse for specialized services that address traumatic brain injury, stress disorders, substance abuse, among other challenges. The goal is more immediate help and access to innovative treatments. They say 180 shadow warriors have been helped. We Americans owe these shadow warrior families we need to get in front of this. With the deep support of his family, Natalini says this holistic approach helped turn his life around. Had I had to do that by myself, I wouldn't have come back from that. With this new mission, Natalini says he feels the same sense of purpose he felt on 9-11. We have an authentic desire to care for that person and that person's spouse. We are working to get it right one person at a time. Coming up, the difficult decisions that come with running one of the world's biggest providers of news, education, and entertainment. This is Eye on America. The first YouTube video was posted 18 years ago, and since then, the site has grown into a powerhouse global platform. The company's new leader, Neil Mohan, is now making the tough calls over misinformation and inappropriate material. Tony DeCoble learns how the exec's philosophy is shaping policy. Neil Mohan. Nice to meet you. Very nice to meet you. We met the CEO of YouTube somewhere you might not expect, at the United Nations General Assembly, where in fact his presence does make a certain amount of sense. If users of YouTube were a country unto themselves, I think it'd be the biggest country in the world. You know, we have a couple billion users that come to our platform on a regular basis and tens of millions of creators. Does that leave you feeling on some level like a kind of world leader? Uh, no, the, the metaphor that I like to use is my job is to build the stage. That stage is so large, it's hard to fathom. More than 80% of Americans say they use YouTube a searchable buffet of not just America's, but humanity's many talents and interests, from ant farms to zip lining, watched for 194 hours a year by the average user. And walking through the company's offices in New York, it's hard to imagine this $29 billion a year business began with a single grainy upload. You recognize this video? Yeah. Mm -hmm cool thing about these guys is that, is that they have really, really, really long um, fronts. You know, I've watched this video at least dozens and dozens of times, and every time I watch it, it gives me goosebumps because it reminds me of where YouTube came from. So what has YouTube become? What is YouTube? Um, you know, in some senses, we're exactly the same as where that video started. We are a place uh, where our objective, our mission is to give everyone a voice and show them the world. There are some people in this world you would not love to have a bigger voice and other things in this world you don't necessarily want to show to everyone. And that's where this job gets a little bit tough, I would imagine. Uh, whenever a decision comes up to me, it's typically uh, a trade-off between two bad choices. Otherwise, the decision would have been made somewhere else in the organization. Yeah. And my number one responsibility is keeping our ecosystem of creators, viewers, all of our partners safe on YouTube. And I put that above anything else that we do. Including profit? That is the North Star by which we govern all of our actions. Safety. Safety of our ecosystem, of our creators, our viewers. But if safety is priority number one, perfecting the algorithm that recommends videos isn't far behind. Your experience with YouTube, um, almost by definition, is going to be different than mine. 
And what better way to get to know the new CEO of YouTube than to look at his YouTube homepage. I got some music here. I got an Otani video. I'm a sports fan. Sports guy. Who's I have a bad back, bad back, so I got some stretching videos. I love that. You can <laughs> learn so me, much right? about a person based on their recommendations. But those recommendations, which drive most of the views on YouTube, have also stirred concern that they don't just reflect interest, but actually develop them, pulling an already divided America further apart. Is the algorithm contributing to that divide by pushing people into like-minded silos? A big part of what we have to do is make it so that the content that you're consuming, the videos you're watching, are interesting to you. But there's, more importantly, there's been a lot of third-party research that's been done that's kind of debunked that. So if somebody comes to YouTube and they're on a journey toward radical points of view, you're saying that they're on that journey independent of YouTube. YouTube is not feeding them videos that walk them down that path. Every viewer's you know, journey on our platform is there. So I don't want to speak to anybody's individual experiences on the platform. Uh, but what we endeavor to do is give them personalized recommendations, but we raise up content from authoritative sources when users are looking for news information. And third-party researchers have shown that we're um, not leading people down those paths. With all that in mind, Mohan recently decided YouTube would once again allow videos that make false claims of fraud in past presidential elections. Just like it happens in town hall meetings or um, at a campaign rally, politicians say a lot of things when they are making their case to the public. And we want to be a platform where that type of discourse is allowed. Uh, and ultimately, it's up to our viewers to judge whether that candidate is ultimately worthy of their vote or not. In the meantime, we're giving people around the world the ability to bring their dreams to life on screen. The company is focused on winning the battle for users. Last week, it announced several new features, including artificial intelligence powered audio translation and superimposed backgrounds on YouTube shorts. And with the help of a product manager, Mohan showed us a new app called YouTube Create. You can edit the video, you can add captions to the video. While hardly a revolution in technology, it's another sign YouTube intends to be just about all things to all users. You really do seem to do it all, right? There is a social media element. There's kind of a media company element. There's kind of a cable company element. What industry are you in? The way I would describe it is we are in the creator economy business. I mean, ultimately, we do two things. We help creators find an audience, and then we help creators earn a living on our platform. And that's our mission, and that's the way that we think about our business. From the web to weather, extreme weather across the country is causing some homeowners to rethink the very foundation of how their homes are built. Janet Chamlian looks at life inside a geodesic dome structure and how it can protect against climate change and natural disasters. Max Begay loves almost everything about living in coastal Louisiana. Every time I come in, I, I love the way it looks. But hurricane season brings back memories of Katrina in 2005, when his home and neighborhood were washed away, almost as if they never existed. Did you think about leaving at all after Katrina? We all did, and a lot of people left. Um, but but I, I chose to stay. He also chose a geodesic dome for his new house, made of close to 300 interwoven triangles. I built the dome because I didn't want to go through the process of, of losing another house. The dome home is able to withstand winds topping 200 miles per hour, making it essentially hurricane proof. When you told people you were building a dome home, what did they say? They thought I was a kook. Not anymore. The spherical home is also energy efficient because surface area is minimized. His electric bills are usually less than $100 a month, a third of what his neighbors pay. Domes have long been built for their resiliency. From the world's first dome stadium, the Astrodome, to the majestic Iron Dome of the U.S. Capitol. We really want to be able to show how geodesic domes are not just stable and resilient, but they're also eminently efficient and portable and practical. The Smithsonian recently reassembled this dome, the first built in North America, after six decades in storage. 
part of a focus on extreme weather. We're absolutely not thinking enough about the role of housing and structures in climate change. Dome-shaped buildings made of concrete can withstand wildfires, floods, and earthquakes. Their shape also allows them to disperse tremendous weight without collapsing. Construction costs are generally higher, but so is the chance of survival. How long will you stay here? Well, how long do I have? <laughs> <laughs> A dome of self-defense for those living on the front lines of Mother Nature's beauty and her fury. Ahead, we go behind the scenes to see the grueling training regimen for Secret Service agents. We close our show with an exclusive look at one of the nation's most elite law enforcement units. The Secret Service counter assault team is charged with protecting the president and other top officials and their families from danger. Nate Burleson put himself to the test to see if he could handle training for the high stakes job. You're gonna be put through some paces today to show you what an agent goes through to become part of the counter assault team. Hmm. Uh, After 11 seasons in the National Football League, I thought I had a pretty good understanding of what it meant to be tested. Uh, 12 terrorists held three buildings and 134 hostages. But on this morning in Laurel, Maryland, I was about to find out what it really takes to make one of the most exclusive teams in national security. The United States Secret Service. Created in 1865 by the Treasury Department to police currency counterfeiting, the Secret Service expanded its role after President William McKinney was assassinated in 1901. Today, they are an agency of more than 7,000, responsible for the protection of the American president, vice president, visiting world leaders, and our financial system. There's many days when I wish I was still back in the field. Really? Because that was a lot more fun oh. than sitting behind a desk. So Secret Service Director Kim Cheadle knows the stresses of the job as well as any director in its history. She was on the protective detail of then-Vice President Dick Cheney on 9-11 and on a team that protected then Vice President Joe Biden during the Obama administration. What isn't talked about are the days when everything goes according to plan. Our, our successes, 99.9% .9 of the time, are, are never talked about, and, and we are just the silent success in the background of history. And our job is just, just to keep our head down, don't listen to the noise, uh, and do our jobs. Does it fit all right? Feels in the NFL, Coaches always preach the mantra of, do your job. Today's job, to try and understand the tryout process for special agents of the Secret Service, who believe they are fit enough and smart enough to join the division's special counter assault team, otherwise known around here as the CAT team. Let's head down to the 15 yard line. Instructor Jay Randall has been with the Secret Service for nearly 30 years. You'll come up, see the red dot through your scope. And if you want to make the CAT team, you'll likely need to go through him. Am I resting my yes. right here? What you have right now is not bad at all. Okay. We had the rare opportunity to work with live firearms. Good, good. See and it was an eye-opening reminder of the power of these weapons. Good. And gun safety was constantly being stressed. Chamber, and magazine empty. empty, right? It's unsafe, yeah. Oh, exactly. Begin, one, ah! I got you. Ah! Two, one more. Ah! We picked okay. the hottest and no, stickiest no. day of the okay. summer in Maryland. Okay. I'm outside. Where real field temps climbed to nearly 107 degrees. <sighs> and as you can tell by my heavy breathing, that's it, that's it, that's it. Good. I Around. was feeling that heat. So why do we do this? To create that fatigue. Yes. Mental, yep. mental fatigue, physical fatigue. We can only go so far with situational fatigue, because I really can't hurt people, but I can put them under duress physically. That's what we do. It's not an issue of can you do it. A lot of these guys, they can do it. Dry, flat range, everything perfect, cool conditions, so on and so forth. Can you do it on fire? Can you do it in the moment? Can you do it when you had it behind handed to you? After a quick reset and some much needed hydration, you gotta work. the second part of the fitness test resumed. Out of the water! With me! With me! It was one of the most demanding physical stresses I've ever faced. Pulling 100 pound sleds. Right. Let's go, man. Let's go. Tire flips. Oh. The Secret Service needs to make sure all special agents who are responsible for protecting the President of the United States can execute 
while under extreme exhaustion. Oh, oh, stop. Oh, I, see you. I feel you. I feel you. Carrying 45 pound kettlebells up six stories nearly broke me down, along with my photographer, Kenton Young, who was running alongside me the entire time. Jefferson, baby. There. And that. Well done. Well done. I hurt. Then it was more sled pulling. What time is it? It's game time. That's right. Let's, Let's go. go. Let's go. By the time I lifted this 100 pound sandbag over my head and onto my back, the exhaustion and the heat had me cooked. There you go. Let's go. You can't tell from this angle, but I was grabbing clumps of grass with all my might. It all culminated with the real time simulation of the presidential motorcade under attack. Where I used my training. Tangle down! Tangle down! To help neutralize the targets. Special Agent Jamar Newsom is a former NFL wide receiver who now works for the Secret Service. Reps are so important. It's just like in football. Right. It's all about reps. Yep. No matter how exhausting. And that's the only way you get good at it. If you don't practice it, you're never going to be good at it. Right. Are you holding up okay? I'm holding up all right. You chose the hottest day of the year to come that's out and right. train with us. That's I all right. think I earned the respect right. of the men and women of the and Secret then, Service this then, day. Good movement through the woods. And they showed me they can execute with no margin for error. You know, we've been talking a quiet day on the job is a good day. Absolutely. Because that means the objective has been completed. Yep. We say that we like to be uh, quietly in the background and successful and nobody hears about us and then that means it's a good day. For more stories like these and live coverage of breaking news 24 seven, stream us right here on CBS News. I'm Michelle Miller. Thank you for watching Eye on America.